So as far as fertilizers go, always think about what we want to have happen in the plant before we consider the fertilizer. The function of the plant for us humans is varied. Sometimes you want it to be production of fruit. Sometimes you want it to be production of foliage. Sometimes you want it to be uh, vegetable crops. Um, it might be that we want it to um, be a better screen or a hedge, so we need to grow faster and put out more shoots. It might be flowering. Um, it might be um, durability, like turf. So the, the fertilizers are usually targeting certain types of plant growth and health that relates to the function that humans use those plants for. So think about that first, of course, that's part of the consideration process. Um, also, overall, when we fertilize plants, we're putting the nutrients back in the soil that have been removed through plant growth. When plants grow, they absorb nutrients in water and incorporate those nutrients into their body. So when you have harvesting of fruits or um, branches and leaves or pruning or mowing, those nutrients now are taken out of that system and usually taken away. Sometimes erosion can cause that too, but slowly without adding anything new, the soils will become depleted just by the mere fact that plants are growing in them and by the fact that humans aren't leaving the leaves and things that fall and the fruits and things that come out of those plants, they're not leaving them there in that system, they're removed. You know, when we eat a watermelon from our watermelon plant, the nutrients in that watermelon that came from the soil are now gone from the system. So that soil is a little bit more deprived. So we fertilize to put those nutrients back. Um, also we fertilize because some of the plants that we're growing in um, areas you know, like Southern California are not meant to grow here naturally. They would not survive a couple of seasons on their own. They're not adapted to the soils or the climate and they need extra help, extra nutrients to survive. Um, for example, a lot of vegetable crops would never do well in our native soils. Um, and banana trees that people grow, they don't do well without a lot of extra fertilizer. Fruit trees, almost all our fruit trees that we grow here um, are ones that need fertilizer. They cannot handle our, our regular soils and they also um, can't handle even good soil that's not native soil. Let's say you inherited or you, you know, moved to a place where there's good soil and you planted an orange tree after a few years, that orange tree will, will not be doing well. It needs extra nutrients. Um, we also sometimes fertilize <clears throat> plants to speed up their growth, like with hedges or turf, so they fill in, um, push plants to meet a performance that we are looking for. We want things to look good for an event, um, green leaves, flowers, etc. So those are all the reasons, and there are probably more, that we add fertilizer to soil types of fertilizers, there's two main types, organic and synthetic. Organic just, it's not um, meaning that these are raised with organic, like legally organic certified methods. That's uh, a agricultural term well, how, uh, relating to how plants are grown when you buy organic food. In this context, organic fertilizers just means those fertilizers come from directly from a living um, organism source like manure or kelp meal. So those are organic, meaning they're organically based organisms that have died and parts of their bodies or have been ground up and made into fertilizer. Those are the best for the environment because that's the natural way. Leaves, bugs, Worms, uh, larger creatures die and fall to the ground and they're decomposed and the minerals and nutrients in them become released to the soil for the plants to take up again. Those are our natural organic fertilizers, but we can also buy organic fertilizers, as you know. These are slow release. The nutrients in them are released slowly at the rate that decomposition occurs into the soil and made available to plants on a long, slow, um, at a long, slow rate. Synthetics, sometimes um, these are necessary. These are ones that humans produce and they're manufactured in a chemical process. Those, those fertilizers, like something like miracle Grow, and these are usually fast release, although there are some slow release um, synthetics now coming on the market, which is great. 
um, but a lot of them, especially used in agriculture, are fast release. You're getting just usually that one or maybe two nutrients in liquid form that are um, then used to irrigate your plants. So you get a quick, fast, intense fix from synthetics. Here's an example of the front of a bag of fertilizer or turf fertilizer for lawns. This is a synthetic fertilizer. It's made of 16% uh, nitrogen, about 6% phosphate or phosphorus, and about 8% potassium from potash. And there's a little bit of sulfur and iron in there too. So um, this one is all from synthetic, so made in a, you know, industrially made fertilizers that's applied and it's all quick release. So as soon as it hits the lawn and there's water added, those nutrients are flood the turf uh, system of fertilizer. And here's um, the front of the bag of a organic lawn food or lawn fertilizer. And you can see the numbers um, of the ingredients of that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. They come from a different source. They're not synthetically made. They're from organic sources, but they're also lower in percentage. So you just can't get natural organic fertilizers with as high of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium as you can synthetically because uh, natural organic organisms do not carry um, those three nutrients in as high of amounts. So um, if you're, when you're making it as a synthetic, you can just you know, jack up the, the nitrogen as far as you want or any of the other nutrients, but it's different when you're using things that are natural like uh, manure and kelp meal and blood meal and bone meal and things like that that um, just don't have that the highest percentage. So this lawn food, this organic fertilizer for lawns is 7.5% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus and 5% potassium. So look at the bottom, the writing on the bottom, the example of a fertilizer for lawns would be like 735 NPK, that would be a, uh, an organic one. And that just tells you the relative amount of nitrogen in the fertilizer is 7% by weight. So if that's a hundred pound bag of organic lawn fertilizer, seven pounds is nitrogen. Three pounds would be phosphorus and five pounds would be potassium. And it also tells you the amount that's soluble and insoluble. Very little is uh, soluble in here. Um, you've got 6.5% insoluble nitrogen, but 0.5% water-soluble nitrogen. So just 0.5% of the nitrogen, nitrogen in that bag becomes, it dissolves as soon as water is applied. But most of it does not. It takes time to dissolve and wear down. That's a slow-release fertilizer. And anything from a natural source is going to be slow release. It just takes time. And to compare the two, you can see that uh, Turf Supreme has higher nitrogen. It's got 16% nitrogen, where the, um, the other one has 7%, etc. So they are naturally derived fertilizers are just not going to be as high, as I said in the last slide. The nitrogen is important for, for grass and turf lawns. Um, it helps the, the grass blades grow. It's vegetative growth. That's what nitrogen does in a plant. It increases and promotes vegetative growth. And um, the phosphorus in that helps the roots form and grow. So you don't want too high of nitrogen in the synthetic fertilizer because that can some of that can run off into the into other places like the creek or the ocean and be bad for the environment. And the plants because the plants can't absorb all that nitrogen right away, and a lot of it ends up running off the property into other places where it can cause an imbalance. So kind of tagging on to what I said in the last slide. Your three major nutrients that are focused on in fertilizers, and they're not the only three plant nutrients, but these ones tend to be um, the ones with the most focus and emphasis on fertilizers because plants tend to need these three the most and there's a little bit of a history to this NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, why fertilizers focus on those three and not the six macronutrients or any other combo. And partly is because way back in the early part of the 20th century, farmers and scientists figured out that those three, if you give them the, the maximum amount, 
or the ideal amount of NPK, your crops will produce the most yield. So you, it'll, it's the best bet of fertilizer addition to increase your harvest. When you add other nutrients, it doesn't necessarily increase your harvest. It might be better for the plant if you threw in some sulfur and iron and things like that, but it's not going to be the most effective way to maximize your crop. So fertilizers still on the market focus on those three, and they are probably three of the most, if not the most, three important plant nutrients, but they are sometimes sold in fertilizers kind of to the detriment or to the exclusion of the other ones too. Anyhow, we'll focus on those two because that's what's out there. Nitrogen um, is focuses, uh, nitrogen is used by the plant mostly for vegetative growth. So when you give a plant nitrogen, it increases stems and leaf growth. And it's not something that produces more flowers and fruit or roots. It just promotes above ground vegetative growth. Vegetative means non-reproductive, so not flowers or fruit, but just leaves and stems. Sometimes you'll, I've had a, a few friends say, you know, they grew tomato plants and they put in lots of great compost and manure and their plants grew and grew and grew, but they never got any tomatoes and they wondered why. And I said, well, you probably added too much nitrogen. And when a plant is growing in a soil that has all uh, tons of nitrogen, not literally tons, but a lot of nitrogen, the plant in some ways thinks, well, I'm fine. I have all everything I need. I can grow forever. I don't need to reproduce. I don't need to make seeds because I've got everything I need here in this high nitrogen soil. And that's sometimes what happens with people. If the nitrogen in the soil is too high, the plants don't flower and they don't fruit. So you don't want too much if you're trying to have fruits and flowers as part of the end product of your fertilization regime. Some of the sources for nitrogen, um, if you can get, of course, synthetic sources that are just purchased and those are synthesized and manufactured fertilizers and those that um, produce nitrogen fertilizer and they're synthetic, those use fossil fuels. So it's an interesting use of um, you know, the crude oil that comes out of deep in the earth is to make fertilizers. Um, organic sources of nitrogen are like grass clippings, green leaves, anything that uses a lot of nitrogen is going to have a lot of it in its um, vegetation. So also legumes, things that, um, that have a lot of nitrogen in them because they have an association with bacteria that suck in the nitrogen and give it to the plant. The, the leaves of those plants, of legumes like beans and peas and other leguminous plants, those will also have a lot of good nitrogen in their um, vegetation and they can be used as a cover crop or a fertilizer or a mulch. Um, other sources of fertilizer that are organic, um, bird and bat guano is very high in nitrogen and so is blood meal and that comes from the dried blood from slaughterhouses of cattle but it is sold as a fertilizer instead of uh, synthetic. Phosphorus is also very important. It stimulates flower, fruiting, and rooting. So if you have something like a rose fertilizer, it will have high levels of phosphorus because we really grow them only to produce flowers. And um, that's the focus. So you, you do focus your fertilizers and your fertilizer recipe on the product you want from that plant. Synthetic fertilizers are available um, in phosphorus and also um, organic sources as well that come from things like rock phosphates, bone meal, high phosphate, bird and bat guano. And you can see in that um, slide, the image on the right, um, guano, bird guano especially has been sold for you know, over a hundred years as a fertilizer for cotton and corn. And it is mine, meaning someone goes into a cave, bat cave, and scoops out, you know, feet upon feet um, of deep, rich bat guano. And that's also done off of sea uh, rocks off of offshore where seabirds land and, you know, migrate through. And they, they stay a long time and the, the bird guano builds up also feet upon feet of it, very deep. And they're great for a fertilizer. Potassium is uh, overall a nutrient that can stimulate the plant's vigor and disease resistance. Um, so it's kind of like the, the overall vitamin or nutrient for plants. And there are synthetic 
sources of the fertilizer and there's also organic sources listed there. One quick and easy way to remember the functions of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a fertilizer is up, down, all around. Nitrogen uh, supports and stimulates above ground growth, that's the up, the vegetative part. Phosphorus stimulates root growth, that's the down. Um, and then um, potassium stimulates all around, overall the health and vigor and disease resistance of the plant. So that's up, down, all around. And in addition, the phosphorus also promotes root and fruit development. A local uh, garden store, Island Seed and Feed, creates their own landscape mix. It's general for landscape plants, fruit trees, etc., vegetables, roses, and its, um, its numbers are 3.75, 1.5, and 1.75 for NPK percentage in that mix and it's, it can be used as a just general all-around um, landscape fertilizer for lots of different things. It's made from alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, kelp meal, fish meal, feather meal. It's a nice all-purpose one. We use it on campus all over the place regularly. A couple other fertilizers that um, are sold at Island Seed and Feed and other places as well. Um, azomite is one that has very uh, little NPK in it at all. It's really a fertilizer for giving your soil the micronutrients that might be missing. So trace minerals and nutrients. Azomite is not a real name of a, some kind of rock or mineral. It's just a acronym for A through Z organic minerals and trace elements, azomite. So it's supposed to have like every element on the face of the earth in this. And it comes from a natural um, organic mineral source from volcanic deposits from central Utah. So we like to use that in addition to something like the landscape mix, and it really is helpful because it really rounds out what the plant is getting. Remember those trace nutrients, the micronutrients, you don't need hardly any of them, but you have to have that small trace amount because they are essential for plant growth. Another um, Mineral source um, that can be mined for a good fertilizer that's, again, for the lesser known nutrients is um, green sand that has a little bit of potassium in it. You see the 003. And it's New Jersey green sand. It's, it's seabed deposited minerals rich in potassium, and then, but also iron, silica, magnesium, and over 30 other elements in trace amounts. So. That is mined um, on the East Coast, and it is used as a great additional fertilizer to an all-around NPK fertilizer. I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. Um, nutrient solubility, it really depends how soluble those um, nutrients sources are um, to show you whether it's a fast release, slow release, et cetera. Um, slow release um, fertilizers are the organic ones in general. And there are some synthetics now that are made to be slow release, um, but those are still kind of newer on the market. And then of course, fast release synthetics are, uh, are the synthetic ones, the ones that are manufactured. And as soon as you apply them and there's water, all of the nutrients in them become available. Often that can be quite wasteful, up to 30, 40% of those cannot be absorbed by a plant and they get washed away. In this particular one, um, sulfur is added to the mineral, excuse me, to the fertilizer because it's the compound that carries the nitrogen, and, uh, it's ammonium sulfate. Ammonium is one of the forms of nitrogen that can be absorbed by a plant, but the sulfate is added in there because that's a little bit more stable. Ammonium sulfate can be put into powdered form and then once the water hits it, it'll break apart and become ammonium and that can be absorbed. So how do the plants uh, obtain nutrients in natural systems. Of course, we've talked about this a few times, but let's just go through the little cycle. So you've got organic matter, like pretend in your mind some leaves falling off of a tree. They fall to the ground, now they're dead organic matter. They start to be decomposed in the O layer by um, fungi, bacteria, etc. And the nutrients that were in the leaves are now put into the bodies of those microorganisms. When those microorganisms die, Things like bacteria only live for a few days to a week or so, and then they die. 
So those nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other minerals that were incorporated into the body of the bacterium, for example, when it decomposed a leaf, now they're held in the body of that organism for a while. And then something, they die and they get decomposed, and then, then those, some of those nutrients are released. So it's, it's a, a way that in nature that slow release of nutrients occurs. Once they're released again and there's water, those nutrients can dissolve into water and be absorbed by plants again. So slow release fertilizers are closer to what happens in a natural system in that sense. Fast acting, the highly soluble synthetic fertilizers, they have a place. I mean, I think they're probably not good to, to be used as much as they are used all over. They, they harm the soil, they um, pollute waterways, they cause unnatural growth rates, et cetera. There's a lot of reasons that we probably should veer away from those. But certain situations, they're helpful. You know, if a, a plant is in critical condition and it, if it doesn't get nutrients right away, those fast release ones will be really good. Um, and, or, you know, you've got something a little bit more social emergency, you've got a wedding coming, or you're trying to sell the house, you might want to um, throw on there a couple times some fast uh, acting soluble synthetic fertilizer to just kind of make everything pop, all the plants look really good, something like that. But there are problems with the synthetic fertilizers. Let's take synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, for example, that are, are high solubility. Um, some of the problems, wasted resources. Once the soluble fertilizers get wet, they're available all at once. The plants can only absorb about a half of the nutrients released. So half are wasted and half become a pollutant in the waterways or the soil. Um, they only contain a few nutrients. Usually synthetics are very narrow in their spectrum. They only have NPK and that's it, maybe a couple more, but often they're targeted just at those and the rest of the nutrients are neglected. Um, I talked about pollution potential, but also about um, pest problems. So, so things like high nitrogen can um, cause a plant to grow really quickly. The vegetative growth have long inner nodes, really fast, succulent, um, soft green growth. That's almost, it, it is unnaturally fast. And those are the types of tissues on a plant that pests love because they can poke their little mouth parts into it really quickly. It's very succulent. So it can cause pest problems by creating tender vegetative growth. It's just, you know, in the insect world, there's a big neon sign that's put up on a plant that's been fertilized with nitrogen that says, salad bar, come eat this plant. So um, that can be a problem too. It, it really, even though it may seem like it's not some horrible thing, it, this is done over and over and over, it can weaken the whole system. And I say that because I know people that are gardeners and this happens. Um, Lotus Land, a private garden here in Santa Barbara is, um, has told that story many times and they had, um, they would do fertilizers, high nitrogen, synthetics, and they do um, spraying of pesticides on a regular basis, you know, every single month. And they had huge swings of huge pest outbreaks and plant diseases. And then they'd spray stuff and it would get better for a few weeks and then it would get, uh, come again and be almost even worse. It's kind of like, humans using um, antibiotics. Sometimes they're really useful, but if they're overused, they can cause secondary problems too and weaken your whole system. So remember that organic fertilizers work slowly. The nutrients can only be absorbed by a plant's roots when that, that nutrient is in, in an inorganic form. So it takes time for those to decompose and become available to the plant, which is beneficial in the sense that it's the natural rate of uh, nutrient availability and plant absorption of those nutrients. Urea is high nitrogen. It's the main nitrogen containing component of mammal urine. And that can be used as fertilizer. But a synthetic urea was also developed, which is a source, which is what I talked about before, the um, what was used, um, what is used to create Night, high nitrogen fertilizers from using fossil fuels. So um, Frederick Wohler in 1828 developed the process for creating synthetic urea and a process later that was used by the fertilizer industry to synthesize nitrogen fertilizer. And um, a side note for the history geeks, but in 1824, Wohler's synthetic creation of urea signified the first time an organic molecule from a live form 
was synthesized without living organisms. So you've got um, an organic molecule made from inorganic form, and but it was an organic molecule. So that was the first time that humans ever were able to, to synthesize an organic molecule. And that supported this kind of now seeming crazy idea called vitalization that we can give make life from inanimate objects, kind of the Frankenstein idea. Here's a chart comparing and contrasting the advantages and disadvantages of different types of fertilizers. So starting with the upper left, um, green waste means just the stuff you take off your plants that already has nutrients in it, um, the advantages of that and disadvantages, compost tea, organic fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers slow release and synthetic fertilizers fast release. So I'll, it's from the top to the bottom, you're going from the, from the most natural to the least natural on the bottom. And the advantages and disadvantages are outlined there. A couple of things, I won't go through all of it, but a couple things to mention are that organic fertilizers are more, it says high material costs as a disadvantage. They're more expensive, but the advantage is they have a wider range of nutrients. They're beneficial for the microorganisms. You don't have to put them on as often. And the system is more, your plants and your soil are more adapted to that type of fertilizer. Um, some of the benefits of synthetics are that they're, they're less expensive and uh, they've been used for so long in bulk form manufactured that they're cheaper and your plants get an immediate response. But they tend to have a narrow range of nutrients. They have problems with disturbing the soil system and they can make more plants more susceptible to pests, etc. So kind of read through those and get a feel for the pros and cons of each of those. So as far as sustainable soil care and landscaping, some things to do, avoid the fast acting high nitrogen fertilizers, use a lot of so uh, organic matter in your soil, you add as much as you can, compost and mulch. Add uh, organic supplements as much as you can, um, and plenty of irrigation, but not too much, not too little, just the right amount, and proper fertilization. So again, not too much or not too little. You want it right, hit it right in the middle there. And it's different for every garden and system and plant. Let's talk uh, for a few slides about recycling grass clippings. So if you've been in one of my other classes, you've seen I've show slides about the ubiquitousness of lawns. Lawns are all over the United States, other countries too, but let's just focus on the US. If you put all of the acreage of lawn that we have in the United States together, it is more acreage than if you take the top eight crops in the United States. So we've got wheat, soybean, corn, rice, and then other crops for other crops too. And the acreage of all of those is below the acreage of lawn. So I always like to say, if you, if an alien came to our planet without us knowing and just watched for a while, they would say, obviously this lawn is sacred. There's more of that than even their food crops. So we spend a lot of time on lawns. And although I personally think we could do with about 1% acreage of all the lawn we have, and we'd still be okay, um, people like them. You know, a nice open green space is pretty. So we need to know how to manage them more sustainably. One thing to do, and it relates to fertilizers, is this process called grass cycling. Um, we take the, the clippings that come off when we mow our lawns, leaving them directly on the lawn to decompose, leaves those nutrients there. So that's what grass cycling is. You know, nothing, nothing hard to understand. It's just simply leaving those there. Sometimes um, machines, th these are both, you know, small mowing machines, but the one on the left, um, looks like they've got an attachment. Sometimes the sit-on mowers will have a blade that rotates and instead of shooting the, the, um, the cuttings off, the clippings off into the back or into a bag, they'll, you, can put a, you can plug it up so the clippings get rotated around. They stay in the blade area for a lot longer and they get chopped up smaller and then they're better grass clip, kipping, <laughs> clippings to stay on the lawn and um, decompose really quickly. The push mower on the right 
you know, when it goes through one, one um, pass through your lawn and it's cutting off the blades, but those blade pieces are rather large, you can still leave those there, but they look a little worse to have these big blades sitting up on top of the lawn for a while and they decompose more slowly. So, but that's what grass cycling is. Here are some pros and cons of grass clippings. Leaving the clippings on the lawn um, retains the fertility in the soil. When you constantly remove the clippings, you're removing all that nitrogen and other nutrients that are in the blade of grass that you paid for. You paid for the water and the nutrients, the fertilizer, and then you're hauling it away and giving it away. So leave it there and the soil will stay more fertile, won't get depleted of those nutrients. So you have to, you know, and then when you do do that and you remove the clippings, you got to keep adding, adding fertilizer back in there and the microorganisms in the soil get starved. So that's a, that's a negative. Um, back to the positive, it's a more stable soil life. The microbes in the soil are happier because the nutrients there are more stable. Um, and you get less compaction leaving the clippings there. You get more compaction when you remove the clippings because you're, the microorganisms start to die and they're part of what keeps the soil open and healthy and um, a couple more things to look through there, pros and cons. This is just some facts about grass cycling and why you might want to consider doing it. If you're caring for a lawn, um, moving to this type of grass cycling system is going to benefit you and your lawn. Um, those blades of grass that you cut they decompose really fast. Two to three days, that, that clipping, if you leave it there, will decompose and release the nitrogen in the blade to the soil and be reabsorbed by the lawn, the grass that's growing there in, the, in that short time period. So the grass cycle, the nitrogen cycles really fast through the grass. So to remove it means quickly those blades are going to start to need more nitrogen and they'll, they can starve if you don't keep adding fertilizer. That's why lawns are so high maintenance. And they're not high maintenance in the sense that you can, you know, get a big sit on mower and mow it pretty quickly, um, but they have to be tended to often and they're very labor and resource consumptive. Um, average lawns create about three to 400 pounds of clippings per thousand square feet per year. And if you think about it that way, it's a lot of organic matter that's being removed from that soil. Um, all of those clippings equate to about 30 pounds of fertilizer. So um, it's better to leave it there if you can. I mean, some clients would say like, no, I, do, I don't like that, it looks bad. There could be situations if you work at a, um, a golf course, um, you might not be able to do that, especially not on the greens, maybe on the fairway. Um, but yeah, um, grass cycling reduces labor also for lawn care. And we already said, but it says it here too, again, organic matter is increased in the soil when you leave the clippings there and it can save lots of time hauling all those clippings to your green waste and then buying fertilizer and hauling it back. So try to be efficient as possible. So the main point of this slide, these two tables and all those numbers in there, is to be careful and discerning and thoughtful about how much fertilizer you apply. You don't want to apply too much. You want to apply the right amount for your plants, but too much and too fast will result in pollution. The overabundance of those nutrients will wash off your site and into nearby creeks, ocean, lakes, ponds, and it can cause eutrophication. And it's a serious pollution source in the United States and throughout the world near agricultural systems and gardens too. Um, what happens is you get, let's say nitrogen, you get too much nitrogen um, into your a creek or a pond or a river or a lake and you get um, a, a high algal growth. So algae need that nitrogen and they grow and then the bacteria start to have a feast on the algae and bacteria, um, the way they work is like humans. They basically you know, eat the algae and they do the process of respiration. So they consume oxygen like we do. We breathe in oxygen for our metabolism. So do these bacteria that eat the overgrowth of algae and then you le it leads to these waterways having a depletion of oxygen. Um, and that leads to death of fish and other things that rely on the oxygen in the water. This has happened many places where you get systems. Um, let's see, I think Malibu Lagoon 
became anoxic, meaning um, about 10 to 20 years ago, uh, it, it, be, it became very unhealthy and there was dead fish seen in it. And uh, largely because of the runoff from all the, the homes and things that use too many fertilizers, that there got to be too much nitrogen and other nutrients in that water, the algae grows, the bacteria go crazy and consume the oxygen, then the fish can't breathe. So, and then it leads to other things like the birds that use the fish um, die because they can't have food. So it's significant. So think about that when you're gonna be fertilizing. Don't do it indiscriminately, especially in a place like Santa Barbara, where we are right near the ocean and it can cause problems by um, sending too many nutrients and nutrient pollution into the ocean very quickly. So some more bigger picture things to talk about. Remember that soils naturally are nutrient rich in most systems. Healthy nutrient rich soils are uh, a result of the cyclical process of organic matter falling down or on the soil and being decayed, fine roots growing and dying in the soil and the biological action of all the microbes in the soil creating humus that coats the soil's minute particles into this matrix that's kind of like a fluffy matrix that doesn't collapse on itself because of this sticky colloidal um, particles in there. So it's really important to have life in the soil and organic matter. And many of the practices we use in landscaping and agriculture deplete the organic matter and disturb the microbial life and it causes a collapse in that system, which ultimately will come back to bite us because it's not supporting the plants that we need for food plants or not our plants won't look the way we want them to in our landscaping. Um, in general, most of the soil microbes or organisms are found in the top few inches, one to three, varies a little bit, but in general, the top few inches, that's where most of the oxygen is in the soil. And that's where most of, so the, the bacteria and the fungi that require oxygen are, can only live in that aerobic portion of the soil. And they also need water and that's where the most moisture is and that's where the most organic matter is that, and the, the um, microbes are breaking down, eating the organic matter and making them available to the roots. And the roots are often giving out sugars to attract those bacteria to them so that they will break down the organic matter near the root hairs and root tips so the plants can absorb the nutrients. There's a lot going on in there. Um, the microbes decompose the plant materials into this um, stuff called humus. It's a complex um, material, lots of different carbon um, compounds in it, but it's basically the dark rich stuff that you see that make a, makes a soil really fertile and the um, bacteria are making those minerals in the soil available to plants through decomposing organic matter and the process is called mineralization. How many organisms in the soil, the top few inches? Well, one study looked at just the top three inches and there were four billion bacteria per gram, lots and lots. And then three feet down, only 37,000 bacteria per gram. So it really drops off because the, the, again, the moisture drops off, the organic matter drops off, and um, the oxygen drops off as you go down, so the bacteria just don't exist there. There are some really nice mutualisms between plants and some soil microbes. Um, and I mentioned it before, but one that's pretty common among most plant species is the fact that the roots of plants, especially perennials and trees, will exude, kind of squeeze out sugars that they make, the plant makes, through photosynthesis and other organic acids and compounds that um, is food for the bacteria. So it's attracting those bacteria to their root tips. And then once those bacteria are proliferating there near the root tip, they decompose more and make more nutrients available for the plant to suck up. Another cool mutualism that's found in the soil plant system are, is the relationship between plants and nitrogen fixing bacteria. So when we say nitrogen fixing, it's not because nitrogen is broken. It means fixing like fixation. 
in a kind of in a chemistry sense, fixing means um, attaching, gathering the nitrogen and incorporating it into something. So there are certain bacteria, and look at the, the images here. Um, these nitrogen fixing bacteria like nitrosomas is one, um, one genus of them. And they live in little nodules shown in pink in the image and in the diagram on the roots of plants. And they can absorb the nitrogen that's in the air in the soil. So the soil, remember, has pockets of openings where there's water sometimes and there's air. There's nitrogen gas in those pockets in the soil, and those bacteria can absorb the nitrogen directly from the air in the soil and give it to the plant. Otherwise, the plant has to absorb it through its roots, and nitrogen is often a limiting and um, nutrient in the soil. There's not a lot of it. It gets, gets absorbed quickly, and it gets washed away quickly. So these plants have a second way of getting it. They can get it through these nitrogen-fixing bacteria living in nodules on their roots who gather the nitrogen from the air. So why do these bacteria do that? Are they just super nice? Uh, no, well, maybe they're nice, I don't know. But um, the plant gives sugars to the bacteria. The bacteria can't make sugars for itself. It has to eat them, you know, get them somewhere like we do. Um, so the plant gives um, the bacterium sugars and the bacterium gives the plant nitrogen. That's a, a cool way of the plant getting its own fertilizer. So I mentioned before too, these nitrogen fixing plants are legumes. And so where you grow these plants, um, this is showing you like a, a, a pea or a bean plant there. Where you grow these plants, remember fine roots and root hairs are constantly growing and dying. You ever heard the analogy about, um, well, ever heard this fact about the human stomach replaces itself every seven days. Like every cell in the lining of your stomach is replaced within about a week. So you have a whole new stomach every week, you know? And so it's similar to this with the root hairs of a plant. They're growing and dying constantly. So they're adding a lot of nitrogen. Um, well, they're adding, excuse me, they're adding a lot of organic matter to the soil around the root ball of that plant. But if it's a nitrogen fixing plant, they're also adding a lot of nitrogen to that area around the roots of that plant. So planting these nitrogen fixing plants um, can help improve your soil. It's a natural way to fertilize your soil without adding any kind of store-bought fertilizer. And to say more about that, um, things that are leguminous are perennial plants, trees, you're looking at bean plants, pea plants, excuse me, um, and lupins. It's um, a wild and horticultural um, flower that's grown, but there's lots of different things in these groups of leguminous plants that you can buy and grow and plant them around trees that might need more nitrogen or soil that is bad and you want to improve it just by growing like a cover crop. Fava beans is another good one, vetch, sweet peas, and, but there are also perennial plants too. Some of our native plants in this Southern California area are, um, they're not leguminous, but they are nitrogen fixing. Like Ceanothus is one of them, alder is another. So you can look all this stuff up pretty quickly online, nitrogen fixing plants for your garden and for your area and use them to help support the other plants or just because you like them because they're pretty or to improve bad soil. Here are some specific examples of nitrogen fixing plants. In the temperate zone, I mentioned before a couple on the last slide, but also clover and alfalfa and lupins. Um, those are often found, seeds of those are in a cover crop. Like if you wanna just throw seeds of all those out into an area that the soil you know is really bad um, and you grow those for a couple of years or a few years, that they will slowly improve the soil. Um, sometimes, not slowly, but sometimes quickly. That's why uh, a while back farmers kind of figured out, it was probably at least 50 years ago, they figured out they should rotate their corn crop with alfalfa and, um, or soybeans. Alfalfa and soybeans are both legumes, so they both increase the soil's nitrogen levels where corn just depletes it completely, but they couldn't, so they realized they couldn't keep planting corn crop after corn crop after corn crop in one spot. They would have to rotate it with some of these other plants like these nitrogen fixers that actually help the soil, don't deplete it. 
if you're going to be doing work in the tropics or living there, um, these are three plants just off the top of my head that I knew about. That um, There are many more, but um, Lucana, Inga, Saman are ones that are trees that are nitrogen fixers. We have a really large nitrogen fixing tree, the Inga. It's called the ice cream bean tree. It's in the Lifescape Garden at City College campus. And this, it's so big, the root system is so big that it's fertilizing the soil of many plants that grow around it. They're great. Here's um, the start of a few slides is showing you um, a bunch of different nitrogen fixing plants that can be grown in different habitats and for different reasons, but you might just want them to grow them because they're pretty, but for the dual purpose of looking pretty or nice or providing shade if it's a tree, but also improving the soil. Lastly, for this lecture, I wanted to mention a few way, uh, ways you can notice deficiencies in your soil besides just looking at your target plants. So if you're looking at the plants you planted and you notice the yellow leaves in the lower leaves, you'd think, oh, maybe it's nitrogen deficiency. Um, we talked about that earlier. So there are ways to look at your own plants to diagnose what nutrients are missing, but you can also look at the weeds that tend to grow in your garden too that can indicate nutrient deficiencies. And weeds are really, they're plants that aren't where we want them to be, but um, they also are sometimes healing a damaged soil. So you can think of it that way as we go on to talk about that for this next three slides. So the weeds can indicate um, some type of soil deficiency. If you have um, mosses, spurge, crabgrass, sedges, you know your soil is possibly too moist well, for your plants or maybe too wet. And so that's, uh, those are plants that indicate moist or wet soil. Maybe you don't mind it or you need that moist soil for certain plants, but if you don't, you could start to dry the soil out a bit, irrigate it less to decrease these weeds. Um, sorrel, thistle, mustard, yarrow, pigweed tend to, be, tend to grow in dry and sandy soil. So it can tell you, the weeds can tell you about the soil and the quality of the soil. Um, plantains, nettle, and quack grass are indicate a heavy clay soil. They do fine in that heavy clay soil, but not other plants don't. But again, if you didn't know if it was a heavy clay or you weren't sure and you saw these weeds, you could get a better idea. Or you know, you're on someone's property and you haven't done a soil test, you could just look at some of the weeds and get an idea of the quality of that soil. Um, Things like um, knotweed, nettle, chickweed, morning glory, those are indicating hard and compacted soil. If you see um, mugwort, which is a native here in California, um, or plantains, clover, you know your soil is pretty low fertility. Often you'll see clover growing in um, on athletic fields. Uh, I, my kids have both played a lot of soccer in their day and you see um, kind of a lot of clover growing in the bare spots that form around the goals where there's a lot of foot traffic. And um, once the turf, which is, you know, turf is a pretty aggressively, a grass that's bred to be aggressive grower. It's thick and it forms this nice carpet, but if it gets too much traffic, it'll get too much damage and the soil becomes compacted and the turf dies in those areas. But something like clover can jump in there and do fine. So really when you see clover in, in an athletic field, you know, they're, they're often spraying some kind of herbicide to kill the clover, but really it's management of that soil, which creates the condition for the clover to do well. So you, you, all that traffic, um, you know, near the goal, for example, of one example is um, it, it depletes the soil, the, the, the grass dies out, the soil collapses, the microorganisms die, and the nutrients become less available. And so if you do see clover in a turf, it's a sign of low fertility or poor soil from bad management. But also these other plants can indicate that in different situations. So read through these to get a basic idea. Keep that idea in general in the back of your mind. If you go somewhere, you know, check out the weeds too. And there's great lists online. Um, they're even more elaborate than these two slides I've given you. 
as far as weeds indicating soil quality 